I think we're ready to roll on this webinar. Um, the title of this is Keeping a Nature Journal. It's Best Practices by Teachers Eric Kyle and Peter Vitz. I'm Peter Vitz. I've been working at the Heights for 11 years. Uh, I'll let Eric introduce himself. My name's Eric Heil, and I've been teaching in the lower school at, at the Heights for going on about 13, 14 years now. So I worked at several zoos before I worked at the Heights and have real love for nature. So this is definitely a topic that's dear to my heart. We'll uh, start in just a moment, but I uh, will work through first with some of the practical questions that uh, can arise when we're dealing with this subject. The first is who should keep a nature journal? And uh, one of the things you'll discover as you uh, teach this subject yourself, or if you're getting ready to do so, um, you will realize that really it's something that any age can benefit from. My own children have done it, uh, even to a, at a quite young age. And uh, you'll discover as a teacher and as a parent that we're also students as far as discovering all these new and exciting uh, natural finds and, and the excitement grows uh, greatly as you work on as you work on this with your children or with your students, you really find uh, many new things. We have here a few examples of work, um, and we'll have some more at the end. Just this is just to kind of give you a little taste of it. Yeah. So really, as Pete's saying, any and all ages can benefit from this. If if a child is young enough to to begin drawing. Um, and especially once he begins writing, she begins writing, they, they can really benefit from this experience of keeping a nature journal and, and all through life. Um, really keeping a journal in general is a, is a, a wonderful practice. Um, and we're gonna talk specifically towards a nature journal, one that, that tracks what's going on in the natural world. Well, moving on to uh, another one of the well, basic questions we have, what is a nature journal? Um, and really the, the nature journal is something that should be tailored to the needs of whoever it is that's journaling. Um, and obviously, as I mentioned before, the, the point of it is to simply document your discoveries. Often they'll be very small. Sometimes they'll have text. Sometimes they'll be just a sketch. It varies a lot with the time you have. But the, the really important thing is that it's something um, that the subjective material can be used uh, in a way that you know is going to be effective. So for the children we teach at the Heights, we use a blank notebook, uh, kind of like a mar marble style notebook with blank pages, which gives them a lot of room to draw. Um, but again, if it's, if it's something being used by an adult uh, or by older older children, then you can adjust it to, to what they're going to be doing. Maybe it's most effective to have a, a pocket little sketchbook, or maybe it's more effective to have a more substantial watercolor pad or something that can, that can handle greater artistic endeavors than, than maybe some of the younger, younger kids do. Yeah, I think the, the more beautiful the thing the journal is for me, the more enticing it is to take it out and use it. Um, I have some gorgeous leather bound monograph journals that were given to me as gifts. Um, I really enjoy taking those out and, and doing my best work when I'm using them. But really the journal itself and, and, and what it is, it's whatever you want it to be. There are really no rules in terms of, you know, what you what you put down in there it could be sketches of things you're seeing it could be your own ponderings about the things that you're witnessing questions that you may have um it, it's really for you it's it's something that's going to help you to engage with what's going on in the natural world and it will really help you grow in 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 your own knowledge of yourself and of others so the sky's the limit you could be writing poems you could be painting a little watercolor whatever it is um, all of those things fall into what a nature journal is. And one other point that kind of relates to that is uh, what materials you use when you go journaling. And we'll kind of get to this later, but again, that affects what kind of uh, journal you bring with you, right? If you know you're gonna be using watercolor, then you use something that can handle that. If you know you're gonna be working with just uh, pencil or pen, you can adjust it to that. Um, but 
again, it, it, it's one of those things that you tailor based on, on your own, your own experience. And also of course the, what you can expect your students or yourself to, to accomplish. Um, now this brings us to, um, when and where can I journal the last sort of more practical questions. And as we've kind of touched on already, it's really anywhere and, and always, uh, the idea again, like we just mentioned is that it's something that you can carry with you, whether it's in your backpack when you go for a hike or if it's something you're going to use every day, it's a little, little, uh, pocket notebook, but, um, really it should be something that you can kind of flip open, you know, no matter the environment because there, there can always be unexpected finds. Again, you know, it's, it, it's often the frustration if you don't have it with you, that's probably when you're going to, you're going to find something that you really wish you could have documented. So, uh, and I know I found that myself. Uh, so, so having that, so having that with you at all times and getting in that habit is, is going to happen, especially if you, if you're able to bring it with you and you, and you really kind of dedicate yourself uh, a little bit uh, mentally to, to keeping that, to keeping that all on your body. So. Mm -hmm. And it really is important. I think in terms of when, um, that you do take advantage of all the odd moments of the day, you know, the, the stop at a traffic light, even, you know, you might make some, some observations there and, and then go to the journal once you aren't driving anymore. Mm -hmm. But, uh, so many things happen in nature at odd hours and not necessarily the time that you would, you would, ideally have a big block free so being ready you know even late at night or early in the morning um you know some animals are only active at those times so being ready to journal at all hours of the day is, is a good approach you really get a lot out of it yeah i was speaking to that just the other day we were i was driving along with my boys and and we looked up and and noticed a bald eagle being mobbed by crows so it was uh something that I then later added to my journal, consulting with a, a bird guide, uh, just to, to document that. And, and as, as Eric's saying, it's one of those things you can kind of um, have your eyes open, even at those odd little moments. So it's, it's really good to keep, to keep your, um, your eyes open at all times. And that's one of the big things we're teaching our boys at the Heights. And, and that's what I am teaching my children. And that's, I'm sure what uh, is as much of what is going on um, for those who are watching. Now we yeah. get to uh, to why should I keep a nature journal, which is obviously one of the, the bigger questions. Um, and there are many points to this, and we can't touch on everything. But really, uh, one of the things I I now do at the Heights, besides teaching natural history, is art and and these two subjects are really intertwined and it's, and it's a pleasure to be able to do both because I'm really teaching the children in both classes how to see things clearly. And in particular, obviously with natural history, it's engaging with the environment that's around them. We bring them out on the campus and um, explore the, their familiar haunts and the places that they, the trees they climb. Um, but it's, it's one of those things that, allows the boys to either get out of their their own sort of own head and kind of get in more involved in what's around them but also uh, as Eric mentioned a few moments ago as it also helps us to be a little more introspective because we're allowed to look at something and discover as we study it so its beauty whether it's in in the order it has and or just kind of objective beauty as a flower or a, some animal but um, this is one of the things that that is a huge reason that we that we do this, and it's and it's a natural history is considered sort of the the core class in the lower school, and journaling is considered to be the core really of natural history class. So it's kind of the core of what we teach in the lower school of the heights it relates to how they nature journal, how they interact uh, with nature in this practice. And it really is true that the teaching of, of how to actually see what's happening around you, um, we often come to nature with so many preconceptions. We kind of think we know how ants behave or how, you know, flowers are shaped. And, but once we get the boys to really slow down, to stop and to look at what's going on, 
it blows their expectations away. They, they had no idea that, you know, this wasp would go over to the fence post and would start chewing on the wood of the fence, mashing up the wood into a pulp and then flying off to add to its nest. You know, but that's, you can watch the wasp if they take their time and, and that's something they could journal with. Um, so many things that they see just by slowing down and really stopping to see what's there. And the nice thing about journaling also is that when you attempt to sketch what is you're seeing, no matter how artistic and skilled you are in that arena, um, you really do begin to see so much more detail because you're stopping and you're, you're trying to capture it with your own drawing. Um, many times when the boys are beginning with journaling, you know, when they, you put a leaf in front of them and they sketch a leaf kind of from memory, like how they imagine a leaf would look. They're not really looking at what's in front of them, but when you get them to stop and slow down and to draw each vein and to just draw the details as they go, um, they get a much more realistic representation of what they're looking at. Um, and they're more engaged with their environment. There's so many experiences they get through journaling that uh, help them realize there's way more than they expected in their environment, that there's a tremendous amount of mystery kind of hidden in everyday ordinary things. Even, you know, a little crack in the sidewalk can have moss growing in it. And maybe, a, you know, there's a, a fungus as well. Here we go. This, here's a good slide. Um, and and uh, a whole microcosm of things going on down there um, that are fascinating. So you don't really have to go off on safari or anything. These are things we can do every day in our ordinary environment. And it's tremendously rewarding to find that sense of wonder. You know, when they have so many questions at, at these early ages, um, they can drive us crazy asking why things are the way they are, why, you know, those ants are, are tunneling under the house and what are they doing? And, and we, at a certain point, we reach the limits of our knowledge and, and we don't have an answer for them. And then we kind of just say enough questions, you know, let's move on. Um, and uh, we kind of shut down the wonder that's there. Um, but it's good that we keep asking those questions and help help the boys do the same. And, and journaling is so instructive and so helpful in that regard. So it's, it's a tremendous exercise. It's really important. Yeah. And as you, as you mentioned, it's one of those things that working with the, with kids on this, you're you're reminded often all the things that you don't know of course and so it really does help you in addition to them foster this natural excitement right because as eric mentioned you get to that point where you don't know the answers about you know why this or that creature behaves this way and and sometimes you may know kind of conceptually but we can't know fully or we you know you're studying migration or things like this you know what you know talking with the boys about all these really um, fascinating subjects. You can, you can only explain so far, but it, it always prods you as a teacher to, to want to study more. And, and the boys will get a sense from, of that as you teach them, right? And, and, and uh, not dismissing their questions, but simply saying, well, you know, I don't know myself. And so you can- That's interesting. Yeah, can let's find that. out. <laughs> exactly, you can just have that, that honest, response of you know that's that's a great question i've tried to get in the habit of writing down the questions they have um either in in a notebook or on the board to help help them remember to ask me again so i so i kind of keep it in the front of my head um but uh you know it's one of those things that uh you you discover also with the boys that as they come to know these things this tree that turtle that kind of mammal that they also come to love and care for it more. Um, and it's a, a natural side effect and actually one that I think is also really good to foster is that sense of wanting to care for what's around them as they know more and more about it. Um, and it's a great um, experience to see the boys all of a sudden have a new understanding of things and therefore really, really respect them in a way. And it's something that I think is is a a thing that can be lost very easily and boys boys and children in general tend to be pretty uh, involved in themselves and e easily kind of just start in a destructive pattern as we all know so the fact that they can they can all of a sudden realize wait i you know i've studied this i know it and 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 recognize okay i'm gonna 
I'll, I'll walk around and leave this and leave this thing alone. This tree, I'm not going to hit this tree with a stick because I, you know, I, I've, I've studied it. I know it. So it's a great, it's a great way for them to learn this sense of custody also. Mm -hmm. I'll move on to um, an important question uh, that encompasses a lot of what we have already spoken about and, and, and is kind of the, the crux of this, of this talk to some degree is how do you keep a nature journal, right? And so um, this again relates back to what we spoke about earlier. Of course, it, it, uh, it relates to what you can uh, expect your student or yourself to, to be able to do. Um, one of the main things that, uh, that we do is tailoring our lessons to the season, right? It's, it's, it depends on what's around, you know, you, you'll study what's around you. Um, what's active. This is something that um, the boys will often help kind of direct the, the study because they'll go outside or you'll go outside on a nature walk and you'll find some particular thing. And if you've um, done a little bit of digging around yourself as it were already, you'll, you might have some idea what they might find or you might know what are some of the finds and might be prepared, but sometimes it completely catches you off guard and so these are these are some of the ways that the season really determines what your nature journaling um, and but but there are certain things you can do also as far as what time you go out right there as Eric mentioned earlier there are certain animals that are active in the morning and the evening and the midday there you're not going to get much opportunity to see them uh, different flowers different plants um, that, that are subject to different to changes during the day and uh this is something that that we can kind of use to our benefit and and know what we're what we're looking for but you can never know for sure so it's 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 good to have certain things up your sleeve as far as you know what you what you want to go to um maybe have a particular location in mind as you do a meandering route to that to that spot and uh Eric, is there anything you you want to add about that, just relating to some of these um, tailoring it to your to what's sure. available? Absolutely, I think what you mentioned about having a particular place is very helpful. Having a, a spot that you keep coming back to throughout the year. Um, Colin Gleason, our lower school head, described to me one time how we do natural history, and it was the the valley is our textbook, and the seasons are its chapters. I love that description of, of natural history. Um, so if you have a regular spot that you like to go to or that's easily accessible, keep visiting it regularly. And, um, and then you get to see the changes that are occurring. And even year after year, if you can keep it up for several years, um, you, you learn to see the patterns that are, that are there in nature. And you see familiar friends that are migratory coming, coming back you know, at, at the same time each year. Um, so, Really, you do you tailor it to the needs of, of the student or the person who's journaling. Um, for a young child, it might just be things in the yard. Um, for a more adventurous older child, you know, going on some serious adventures. And and how you actually keep the journal entry. I think one guideline I give to my boys to give them kind of a framework to work within would be: for each journal entry, you need to name the thing that you're describing. If you know its exact name, great, like even a scientific name in Latin, they love doing that. But then the name, then a sketch. Um, and obviously we're not all, you know, the next Leonardo da Vinci, but um, you do your best and you, you, you give it a go. Um, then a few notes, I say about four notes about what you're looking at. Could be questions, could be descriptions, um, just four things that you observe. And then finally, the date and the time and even the weather can help because those are all little bits of information that will help to make sense out of the journal as time goes on. Um, so that's kind of one format you could follow, but there are many. Um, and there are some real experts. John Muir Laws is an author here we, that we recommend. He, he has different approaches to journal entries. One might be um, thinking of the, the area that you're witnessing and visualize it in cross-section so that you see a cross-section of the topography of the land that you're looking at and you can look at the slope really and where the water's going and what types of flora and fauna you find at different elevations 
um, that can be an interesting way to to enter a journal entry. Or you could do something where you you kind of zoom in, zoom out, where you you draw a wide picture view of a flower, whatever it is, and then you really zoom in on just the stamen, and you draw the stamen in in tremendous detail. Um, many times with the boys, something that's very familiar, like um, you know a wasp or a stink bug. Um, when we when we have one that's died in the classroom on the windowsill and we put it under a little magnifying glass and they see the tremendous detail and the little hooks and barbs on the feet and how the the two wings of a of a hymenopteran a, a bee or a wasp can kind of hinge together um it's it's fascinating and, and those are all things that you can kind of capture with that zoom in zoom out format um these three questions that john muir laws recommends he's a real nature journal expert out in california um, he first tries to think, I notice, you know, what do I notice about this thing? And you just jot down everything that comes to mind, the observations you're making. Let's say you're looking at an ant and you might observe that you're seeing two antennae there and you're seeing, you know, six legs and, um, you might just observe several things about its behavior. And then you wonder, I wonder what, you know, what are questions you might have about this, this thing? Um, you know, what is it doing? Where is it carrying this bit of food that it just picked up? Um, other questions, you know, bigger questions, anything that strikes you, just jotting those things down in the journal. And then finally, he likes to enter something that says, it reminds me of. And this is a cool thing about journaling that it's not necessarily just what you're looking at, but it could also be things going on in your own personal life. You know, something that it just, or a movie that you saw, or a book you read, or some conversation that you had with a friend. Um, sometimes those things in nature can jog our memory and we draw a connection there and it might help us make sense out of some experience that we've had. So I like that format. Um, I think it's a good one to, to keep us questioning, but to be very observant at the same time and then to draw connections. Many times the connections that we draw are things in nature and the more we observe, the more things make sense and they fit into the big picture. Um, so those are some of the hows of nature journaling. The more you get into it, there, there are many techniques and many other types of approaches you could use to a, a given entry. Um, but if you follow those basics, you'll find it pretty rewarding. And also you'll find that the, the entries that you make are very helpful when you can look back and, and you can make sense out of what happened when, because you, re you recorded the date and you recorded the weather and you knew the time of day and, and um, it fits in with what you're looking at. So. Yeah, to, to that point, it's one of the things I've also noticed that just getting them to stop and observe the weather helps kind of just get them in the mode of, okay, I'm, I'm now listening in a different way. I'm paying attention to my surroundings in a way different than their sort of normal going out for a walk where they might not, they might ignore little things like that. Sometimes I'll even have the boys stop and jot down in there what they hear or see or smell or things like that just to get them kind of in a different mentality a little more recollected um, and then also kind of again speaking to what you were saying eric sometimes a good opportunity for for us at the heights we have a number of pets at various points and so we'll classroom pets and things and those are good uh, subjects for study in the winter when maybe or when the weather is just absolutely foul and you can't get out um, so having those animals that you can you can study up close and easily, and again when when they're familiar, that's often one of the better things because it forces them to actually look at look at something and realize, oh wow, we've had this in the room for months, or I've had this pet dog for years, and yet I never noticed A, B, or C. Right? I, I've never really looked so closely at his paws, or I've never looked so closely at his how his teeth what his teeth structure is like or things mm -hmm. like that so um those those opportunities are great also and of course accessible to your younger kids um, who may love that pet and now having a chance to study it and can can grow uh, and, you know more appreciation a greater appreciation for for that for that sort of family member as it were yeah and i think you know the how um, as you as you do this, as you journal more and more, you realize, oh, I could be doing this. I could be, you know, adding a little more detail with my notes, or maybe getting zooming in a little more with my my sketches. 
and 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 also one thing to think about if art is really a struggle and and sketching it's just miserable um some nature journalists that they keep these things they they take pictures you know so you know for an adult who really wants to capture something they're seeing maybe it's a whole landscape maybe it's just a detail with a flower or a specimen they've encountered um taking a picture and then later printing them out and just inserting them into your journal um could be a way to do that you know there's there's all kinds of ways you can make it more fulfilling more rewarding and more attractive um uh, many times the journal is, is a historical record for our, for us. So, you know, you go to a beautiful place, maybe it's a national park, a great kind of outdoorsy vacation. Um, and if you've kept a journal, so many memories that would have otherwise been lost are retained and you can go back and revisit those amazing experiences that you had, the, the beauty that you saw and, and it stays with you. Um, you know, Derek Jeter, um, this, the retired Yankee baseball player, mentioned in an interview that one of the things he regrets most about his professional career was that he didn't keep a journal. I mean, not a nature journal, but just a journal um, to, to jot down all those amazing anecdotes and, and the people he met and the experiences he had as a professional athlete. Um, so it really is a historic record. Um, and it's, it's neat to think of it that way when you're journaling, that this is something I can come back to years from now um, and, and revisit these, these things that I've learned and maybe realize how much I've learned since then as well. It could be anything. It could be poems. It could be art. Um, there's all kinds of things we can put into our journal. So, yeah, I uh, one other point towards that, and then I'll move to that next slide. Um, was just relating to um, practices and, and different methods for doing your journal entry. And again, as Eric mentioned, there are many different systems or different ways you can go about it. Some uh, in past years. I've tried different ones and one that was often effective is I would go outside and give the boys a task of doing a, a ground observation. That is, they have to go outside and observe something on the ground. Um, other times I might say, all right, now you're doing an eye level observation. So you go outside and they're looking in the shrubs at eye level. Other times we would do an overhead observation. So looking for birds, looking for squirrel activity, nests, whatever it was. It, sometimes if it's if it if you go outside with too broad a sense of the many things you could look for um the boys can get overwhelmed your, your children can get overwhelmed or you yourself can get overwhelmed because they're you know they're countless things but if you focus in on some kind of detail so that relates in some ways to that zoom in zoom out right where you um you pick just one one type of way to look and and let it let it rest that way um, and, and it's been successful with the, with some of the boys, you know, some guys have no trouble going outside and finding something fascinating, but other guys, it can be, it can be too overly daunting. Right. So, and sometimes I find one way to journal is to, to use a field guide in, in an indoor setting even. Um, and we do that in the classroom at times, everyone will get out the same field guide and we'll all do a journal entry on the same bird, for example. One year, I taught a small lesson on the praying mantis, and we were journaling a bit. I did some journaling on the board to give an example of how we would do a journal entry based on what we were looking at in this little golden guide to insects mm -hmm. indoors. And then we went out on a nature walk, and that day we happened to catch a praying mantis. It was, I have to tell you, it's not often that you, you find them, but we did see one, we, we found it, and the boys were ecstatic. Um, I don't think they would have been so excited if we hadn't already done a journal entry looking at that exact same animal indoors and they learned something about it and were intrigued about it. Then we went out and there it was. Um, so journal entries could often be things that you do indoors based on what you're finding in a book. But obviously the, the majority of them we wanna do outdoors with real nature. So it, it can be a combination. Yeah, it's a great it's a great opportunity to to have to have those guides so we'll often use the peterson guide for birds and a countless number of golden guides and uh and just being able to cover some of those things that you know you may find outside but th those are the those are the great experiences where right after you study them you 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 have that opportunity to to study them more in depth it happened this past year where we were just studying rodents and then some boys found a, a dead squirrel and so for them it was like 
a treasure trove of, 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 you know, little observation notes and things like that. So it's, it's great when that, when that works out and, and you'll find, especially as you go on, that that will happen more and more because you're going to be studying some, you know, some of these basic topics. And when you study birds, anytime your children see birds, they'll start to be more aware of, of those things they've just learned, right? Whether it's, you know, specific, what a field mark is, how, how, how they can be looking for little details or if they're talking about reptiles, they can notice, Oh, it's out in the sun. And we had just been speaking about how they need to come out in the sun to, to warm their bodies or, you know, whatever it is. So it's a great, it's a great opportunity for them regularly to link what you talk about in class um, previously, or sometimes of course you can just refer back to what you saw, but it's, it's a great, it's a great experience there as well. Mm -hmm. I'm going to move on now to um, we have a we have a couple of slides of reading rec reading recommendations um, and well I might just speak briefly about a few of them but they this first slide is really more for the study uh, for the teacher study um, some of them have parts that you can read and excerpts to your students depending on the their age um, but they're also very helpful. Um, for example, last child in the woods is one that relates a lot to some of the to some of the why questions, why we uh, journal. Others of these, as you can probably imagine, relate to the how, um, and and some of them relate to the how, meaning you know how you do the artwork. Others that relate relate more to the how am I going to find living things, or what am I going to be looking for in this that this month or that season, um, and. Uh, You'll see mo most of them are books. Um, there are a few uh, internet links as well you can see. Um, and I, what I have not listed here that I mentioned um, a couple of minutes ago are a couple that we use often. The Roger Tory Peterson Bird Guide is sort of the standard that we use, but there are a number of others. I personally own the Sibley Guide, and, and I know there, you know, there's Audubon has one. There are many to choose from, and you um, can kind of find what you like best. And uh, I've just the other day when I saw a hawk in our backyard, I, I used both the Peterson one and the Sibley to get a sense for what it may have been that I saw because it was slightly unusual. So I, being having both was, was actually a, a big help because they sometimes give slightly different information and or in different ways that you can, that you can, um, that can help you a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and while we continue to talk about some of the recommended reading, if anyone has questions, feel free to, to type them in in the Q&A section, and we'll try to get to those as we continue. Um, I, really, I really like the, the Law's Guide to Nature Drawing and Journaling. Um, he, he gives a very thorough treatment of how to keep a journal and, and a beautiful exposition on how to improve your artwork and different techniques that you can employ but his website would be a good place to start. All of these are tremendous resources and, you know, it's it really each one of them is kind of the tip of the iceberg. And um, we re you realize once you start down this path, there's just so much to learn, so many fascinating things to, to observe in nature. Um, and the more, the more we read, the more you, you start seeing things outdoors. I really, growing up in California, I thought I knew a fair amount about nature and I, I did, but, um, I felt that birds were one of the things I knew pretty well. You know, I would look at a bird and I'd say, oh, okay, it's a sparrow or it's a crow. You know, there was like two categories of bird in my mind. And then when I got to the University of Dallas, I took a class in avian ecology and studied birds thoroughly for the first time and realized I was seeing all kinds of birds besides sparrows and crows. <laughs> um, and just was clueless up until then. I had no idea um, the diversity of things that was out there. So. Um, just an exposure to a, a basic field guide, like Pete mentioned, mentions the, the Peterson guides are the ones we use with the boys, but any good field guide, and it doesn't necessarily have to be birds, although birds are very accessible of all the vertebrate life forms. They're one of the most accessible and, and commonly seen. So that's why they're so popular. Um, you know, but a guide to amphibians or a guide to, uh, wildflowers, um, any of those can, can really just turn you on to what's going on around you things that you didn't even notice. Yeah, and one other author that I realized I, is not in there, but we've, we've used 
especially for our, our own study, is Roger Karras has a number of books that um, are, are great because they're, uh, a number of these other books do as well, but he has a great sense of narrative and telling the stories of these interacting organisms because it'll, it'll cover plant, fungus, bird, mammal, kind of just, it runs the gamut and he tells, he weaves it very well into a story. Um, they're, they're great for, for the teacher to, to read up on and to just for general knowledge. And also sometimes if there are passages you find, you can read them or, or even just to give you a sense of how, how you can impart to your students or your children um, some, of these, some of these different ways that animals and many countless things interact. So it's a great, um, his books also are a great resource. I've read, I think, at least two of them and he has many others. I'm going to move to this one other slide that um, relates to recommended readings. This is the, this is a, a selection in particular of books that I've read aloud to my children or to campers, um, with the exception of the last one there. Um, but they they are accessible also to some of the let's say fifth graders even could could get could benefit from them because they relate again to some of this narrative and they relate to the interactions between animals and and uh they're a, a lot of fun that last one pagu by Hall holling clancy holling is is one that um is fascinating because all of his books in fact and this one does a an expert job of it um really weaves together the narrative with really exemplary journal entry style drawings all along the margins of the page and they're just um, it's a great fun book to read because it'll um, it'll kind of suck you in both in the drawings and in the story um, but he has several others as well <clears throat> excuse me that that are a lot of fun and those actually I think or some of his others are on the Heights books list that you can find on the Heights website and those um, his books are are a great resource and they're there are also others for older grades um, on that on some of those lists as well that relate to natural history. Right. Um, we have one question already. What? Which is? Do we have any recommendations for art supplies, carrying cases, and media that we prefer? So I would say the most basic supplies for journaling would just be a pencil and the the journal itself. Um, that's the typical thing we go out in the field with just because it's so portable and there are fewer moving parts. But often we'll then move into using colored pencils. Sometimes the boys will bring colored pencils out on a walk, but many times um, we'll add the color when we get back to the room. Um, I do like to travel with, uh, with a box of colored pencils and I like high quality ones like Prismacolor, um, because the colors are much more vibrant and, and they last much longer. So it is worth investing if it's something for personal use, getting, getting some quality colored pencils. Um, but the most basic supplies, the media that I prefer is generally pencil and, and paper and then adding color pencil. But of course, the sky's the limit. Many people like to bring their watercolors if they have an extended period and they're out there for a while or if you know, they take a photograph or whatever it is and, and come back and have time in the studio to, to, to paint, paint what, they're, what they witnessed. Um, watercolors can be amazing. Um, mixed media, it really, it's, it's whatever works. Sometimes in a specimen itself, you know, you might press the leaf of a tree that you're looking at um, right there in your book, maybe tape it in so that you have a specimen there to, to look at later. Um, same goes for other, other small things that can be flattened and, and entered there. Um, I don't know about you, Pete, with media. Yeah, I mean, I found um, that usually color pencils are kind of cumbersome, as you, as you mentioned. And I, uh, for the most part, use pencil. Occasionally, we'll bring things back to the classroom and use color pencil then. Um, or if there is a very particular place we're going to, I'll use color pencil um, because we can. I can bring them to a very careful destination, and and we can keep track of their supplies, and it's not um, not going to be sort of scattered in every direction. But uh, uh, I've rarely. I I don't think I've ever used watercolor with the students I myself have. Um, but that is is tricky, and you have to 
to some degree, well, depending on your familiarity, you, it most often will require a little more time uh, than just a quick pencil sketch. Um, and a, a, I just noticed that a follow-up to that question was what the hawk was in the backyard. It was a, a dark morph of the rough-legged hawk was what I found it to be. I had, I had to, consulting on, from both guides, um, I was able to determine it because it had noticeably brown face, head, and chest, which was kind of unusual. And there, there were some other things I noticed, but I did regret not having paid even closer attention as it kind of uh, made its way across my backyard to any other field field guides I could um, I could see because field marks because. I was kicking myself thinking, wait, it could have been something more rare. Maybe, you know, maybe I, maybe I could have uh, ridden into to Audubon or something, but it was, uh, it was a, a fun one. Cause I, as far as I know, I've never, I had never seen one before. So um, it was, it was definitely, a, it was a fun, it was a fun find. It had, it had had sort of strange behavior that caught my attention to begin with. And so it was fun to, to be able to identify it. That's great. Yeah, so if anyone does have more questions, there's a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. If you just click there, you can type in any questions you may have. Um, I, I have noticed that even while driving, you know, that if I'm more tuned in, if I turn off the radio, if I, if I roll down the windows, um, there's things going on. Actually, driving is one of the great times to see birds of prey. They like to perch on lampposts and telephone poles because it gives them a, a broad area to survey um, of, of low vegetation of grass. Um, just today I was out running an errand and um, I heard a sharp shinned hawk calling um, and I just knew it from the call. It's actually one of the things we also do with the boys is learn some of the calls the birds have. Um, and then I kind of searched around and I found it and sure enough, there it was. Um, actually one way to help learn the, the calls of birds or to kind of get into birds if you're interested is um, there's an app that you can get through Cornell University. Um, they have a bird app, which uh, is it's very well done. It includes vocalizations and range maps of the, the basic birds that you'd find in North America. Um, so I, I recommend that. It's the Merlin app. Merlin, like the wizard, I've but it's it. also yeah. uh, a falcon species here in North America. So um, the Merlin app from uh, Cornell University. Cornell is really the premier American university in terms of ornithology. They do a lot in terms of the bird counts and other things that go on. So, I've used the app, that app as well. I've, I've found it helpful on, on a few occasions. So, yeah. I'm also just scrolling through some of the observations that um, some sample observations we have um, just to kind of give a sense for things we we will ask the boys to do. Some of them are samples of our work. Some are of the students. Some are um, old. Some are new. But it's a it's a just to give a, a kind of flavor for the different the different types of things they'll they'll be looking at. Uh, and geology, speaking of things that are sort of seasonal, <laughs> geology can be studied, of course, in any season. But it's a good one to have in in your sort of back pocket for those cold months when maybe you're, you're not seeing much when you go outside, uh, studying of rocks and, and um, talking about some of those uh, landforms and things like that can be a great one to do when other things are less accessible. And what I've found that is surprising is oftentimes it's, it can become one of the boys, it can spark some of the most excitement among, with the boys because if you, as soon as you crack open one rock for them and show them that on the outside it looks sort of drab and gray and um, not very interesting, and you crack it open and you show them, you know, many colors or little crystal forms or whatever it is, you you will most likely have <laughs> inspired a little bit of that destruction we spoke about earlier. But but towards I'd say a good a good cause, which is a kind of coming going around and, and discovering and, and learning about these these things it's it's a great and fun one to to look at um i just noticed we have a question which asks what local spot is the best to bring your nature journal for the first time and what time um i can say uh as far as what time 
um, I would think usually your early morning. So if you're go out for a regular early morning walk or you are an early morning jogger or um, you're taking your dog out or whatever, those are, those are good times. The early morning you tend to see because it's quieter, but it's, it's light. You'll tend to see more birds. You'll tend to see more mammals, especially the more seclusive ones. You'll see some of the nocturnal ones on kind of their, their way back home. So you'll get deer, you'll get, you may even get raccoons or things like that. You'll also be more likely to see uh, tracks, see signs of, of the animal activity over, over the night. Um, and as far as favorite places, I mean, it, it, specifically, um, we, it, it's sort of synonymous with nature journaling and with the uh, natural history curriculum at the Heights in general is going creaking. So I would think that's kind of a quintessential, right? So if you have a creek nearby, uh, that's, that's one of the ones uh, that I would recommend. Eric, I know you have, will often go on your runs along, along the creek, so you can probably speak to that as well. Right, so um, absolutely. I think if you live near the Heights, um, Cabin John Regional Park is a wonderful place to go for the first time. Um, there's plenty of parking there on Democracy, um, right by the ten tennis center, and you can go around the tennis center. And there's trails going through the woods as long as well as along the creek. Um, creeks and waterways in general, kind of riparian corridors along creeks and rivers, tend to have a lot of action. There's a lot going on around the water. Um, you're going to see more amphibian and reptile activity. You're going to see more. Um, birds and even the mammals will all have to be coming down to, to drink. So um, yeah, early morning is good. Actually, afternoon, late afternoon can be good as well um, in terms of the, the, the amount of activity you might see. Um, but if you find a spot that's accessible and that's easy to get to, um, experimenting and finding different times of day to go, you get a sense of what's going on um, and different times of year as well. For me personally, one of my favorite local places is the area around Old Anglers Inn along the CNO Canal towpath. Um, there are the billy goat trails there, which are a little more rigorous, maybe for older children. But there's also the gold mine loop trails, which are above the canal on the uphill side. They're lesser known. And there's also the Burma Road, which is very, very even. It's hardly there's hardly any elevation change at all. Um, so it's a, it's almost you could take a stroller. Um, on that on the Burma Road, which parallels the canal towpath, but it's on the, the uphill side, um, on the Potomac side, the Maryland side of, of the canal. So um, I love that area. I love particularly a part of the Goldmine Loop Trail that goes up along the ridge line and then comes to a point where you can overlook Great Falls and you can hear the waterfalls and you can see the canopy of the woods below you. Um, it's kind of one of my favorite spots I like going back to. Um, so if you have a little more time, like on a weekend or an afternoon, um, there's a parking lot there across from Old Anglers Inn. Um, it does get packed on, on the weekends, but there's other lots as well. And if you're willing to pay, you can park it in, in the National Park um, just upstream. Uh, those, are, those are beautiful areas, beautiful uh, and diverse areas for local wildlife. I've seen my first, I saw my first great horned owl while I was in those woods. Um, I saw a scarlet tanager. Um, a huge hickory horn devil caterpillar um, right on the trail there. I've even bumped into Heights families while they're out on hikes as well. So um, I really recommend that spot. And we have another question here, which is, will I be able to access the recommended reading list you put up after this webinar, webinar on a link somewhere? Yes, that's something we talked about and we're going to make it happen. Um, hopefully we'll have, you know, a page that's just linked with the the webinar which will remain on on the forum but um if that doesn't work we'll find a spot on the website and we could send an email to all the attendees letting you know where that is but we'll make that available to you and we'll probably en enhance it a bit as well and one other thing just relating to uh places to go for a uh, nature walk uh near in rockville there are a number of nature centers that have um uh, that have trails that are that are great. They tend to be pretty accessible. Um, there are a number of nature centers by, by Croydon. The Croydon Creek Nature Center um, has some great trails. Uh, and again, it's 
I, that was one of the spots where I took a camp one time and we saw an owl up in the tree during the daytime, kind of reclusive, but because we were quiet and we took it nice and slow, you were, we were able to spot it. So there, there are countless little trails around here. Um, so you can, you can never go wrong finding some, some spot to go and then you maybe figure out your own, your own family favorites or your own personal favorite. Um, but, but yeah, I, I, I think the, the, the best thing is just to find again, also what's accessible for you, you know, with whether you're going with a stroller or going on your own, there, there are lots of different, different options. Mm -hmm. Yeah. On both sides of the Potomac, this area, I grew up in Northern California and it's a very outdoorsy part of the world. People are outside a lot, but I found that, that this area, the DC capital area is, is rife with opportunities to be outside and all kinds of trails and, um, yeah, the CNO towpath, um, the Crescent Trail, and on the Virginia side, many of the old railways have been converted to, to trails. Um, those are very accessible to any age. But if you get off those onto the single track dirt trails, there's, there's a lot more in terms of um, kind of more adventurous terrain um, if you're up for it. I, today I came home along uh, the Georgetown Pike and um, you know, there's several turnouts where you can just park the car literally a second off the road and get into the woods. There's, there's trails everywhere. So. I realize I stopped scrolling through some of these, but I'll just finish off these sample journal entries. But um, I want to just thank everybody for, for tuning in. It's been, it's been great to have a chance to share with you. Um, one of the things I've discovered is, every time I have a chance to revisit what I teach and look at it and talk about it with my colleagues and, um, and just, uh, and kind of just examine how we do things. It, it's great personally and professionally to kind of, to, to see those areas that, that other people are doing, see different ideas that other people are doing and, and to execute them. So thanks for this opportunity. And, and, uh, we hope you can tune in again. Thank you so much. And I hope everyone goes out and, and gets to journaling as soon as possible. There's almost a full moon tonight. So, so get out in there and look.